download the sermon handout for today, which is based on the book of Matthew, chapter 11. And so, let us hear the gospel and scripture of this day. Jesus spoke these words, What can I compare this generation? They are like children who sit in a marketplace and call out to others. We played the pipe. He did not dance. We sang a dirge. He did not mourn. John came neither eating or or drinking, and they said, he is a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved by her deeds. Now at that time Jesus said, I will praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and revealed them to little children. Father, this is what you were, um, Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you that are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for my soul. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon this lesson today that we might be strengthened and emboldened by the words that you would speak to us. For you be thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a, uh, our lesson for today is an interesting lesson. You've got to understand a little bit of the context because otherwise it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so I do want to start by talking a little bit about that context. This was set in a time where Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, had been arrested in prison and was preparing actually to be beheaded and killed. And the disciples of John had come to Jesus with a question about who Jesus is. What was his identity? Because John himself was starting to question whether or not he had wrongly placed his trust in Jesus. Now, if you've lived in your relationship with God long enough, you know there are some times in your life where you start to wonder the same thing. You know, I've lived my life for God. There are a whole lot of other things I could do with my life than this. And I'm wondering if it's all been worthwhile. And that's certainly what John and his uh, disciples were starting to wonder. Now, the critics, Jesus took advantage of this as John's disciples were sent with a message of hope. Jesus said, you know, just tell him he's not given his life in vain. And so as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus looks at the crowd and really becomes very harsh to his critics because he know that he knows that John is really kind of depressed at this point and so he looks at his critics mostly again the scribes and the Pharisees and so forth and he uses this as an opportunity to demonstrate the hypocrisy of the critics now you and I have both lived with critics in our life people are always willing to tell you well you just didn't do enough you just did it this way you just did more of that and I remember when I first came to this church, there were, again, I mentioned about the story last week about visiting with a guy who really wanted nothing to do with the church and relationship with God. But I had some other stories that really made an impression on me. There was this one woman, and I tell you, this is true. I visited with this woman. Her husband was a shut-in. She was capable of coming to church, by the way. Her husband was a shut-in, so I went to their home once a month without fail for probably three or four years or so. After he died, I went to visit with her probably another six or seven times. I, I, I bet you I visited with this woman a total of 50 to 60 times over a three to four year period of time. And she never joined the congregation. She wasn't a member of this congregation. She never joined. I went to see her again several times, probably about five or six times a year after her husband died because I knew it was really hard for her. And then somebody came to the church one time and just said, well, you know, she's never going to join this church. I, I said, you know, it's okay. I didn't go out there. No, you, she's never going to join this church because she said you didn't visit her enough. And I'm like, are you serious? Are you kidding me? I didn't visit her enough? I've been out to her house 50 or 60 times, and I didn't see her enough, and that's why she's not going to visit and come to the congregation? And I just said, you know what? She's just full of what? Excuse me. A load of crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's just making up her excuses so she doesn't have to obligate herself. And that's what critics do, isn't it? Okay? This is what the critics of Jesus are doing. They're hypocrites. Well, we all are hypocrites to some extent. But in this case, the critics of Jesus and John were hypocrites because for John, Jesus says, you're critical of him, you're critical of him, and basically because you're saying he's too severe. He's crazy. He's got a demon. For the critics of Jesus, he's like, you know what? You're blaming me of being a glutton. So it's like, 
you're dissatisfied. You're like dissatisfied Goldilocks, if the story of Goldilocks had existed at the time, and Jesus. Okay, you know the story of Goldilocks. You know, she came into the bear's place, and there was the porridge that was too cold, the porridge that was too hot, and then there was a porridge just right. Well, for these Goldilocks, the critics of Jesus, there's no porridge that's just right. Okay? There's always something wrong with it because they're always critical. And critics relish in being dissatisfied and pointing out your shortcomings. You need to do this. If you just do it this way, isn't it great? But they never, ever, ever evaluate their own shortcomings, do they? That's a critic. So critics basically only add to the burden of people's life and the angst of people's life. They overwhelm the hurting and the heart. The, the, those who are overwhelmed and those who are hurting, they just add to your grief and pain. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. Critics don't really care about helping people who are hurting and, and needy. They're not being critical in order to be helpful to you and prove. They're being critical, and what they're doing is actually being self-serving. They elevate themselves by tearing you down and pointing out all your faults. That's what a critic does. The critic's dissatisfaction ultimately speaks more about their own character or their own shortcomings than the character of those whom they're criticizing. I love this quote from Dale Carnegie. Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, but it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. So let's turn the page to the back page and look at what the purpose of Jesus is. So he's critical of the critics because critics who criticize and never contribute anything or never introspective, never take a look at themselves, always think that they're somehow haughtier, more superior than other people, have a major problem because they don't recognize that they too are just as failed and full of faults as the people that they criticize. But Jesus' purpose, he says, ultimately is not to come to help the critics. You know, if you're a critic, there's nothing I can do for you. It's to help the people who understand that their lives fall short. So Jesus didn't come to please critics and those in power. He never diminishes the value of a person who's hurting. Jesus sees your humanity in the image of God inside of those who are broken, the people that other people have dismissed. Jesus says he comes for the broken and the hurting. He lifts them up out of their dire circumstances and promises to lighten their load, the load of those who've been overwhelmed, those who are hurting, those who are shouldering heavy burdens. At some point in life, I guarantee you that every single person here has felt like they are one of those people. You have felt like you're bearing a load that's too heavy for you to bear, and there's always somebody there pointing fear. Well, if you just do this, if you just do that, always want to point out what you should do, but they're never willing to hold, uh, hold out a hand and help. Jesus says, I've come for you. And it's also a statement to us as Christians, I've also come so that you might help those who are in similar circumstances. Now, I'll tell you, one of the families that we helped in our work camp this year they were in such desperate shape. And people actually have the audacity to point out to them about how they need to get their lives together. And of course, you have the health, wealth, and prosperity doctor folks who say, well, if you just prayed right, God would really bless you. If you just came to God and did this and did that, you would get everything you need. And so we came along just at the right time to prove that that's not proper theology. God is the God of the brokenhearted and lifts them up, not because they've done something for God or pray a prayer in a certain way, but just because God wants to lighten their load and God wants to love them. And we were God's answer to lightening their load. We were the ones that reached out in God's name. I'm so proud of the teenagers and the kids that did that because we brought the love of God to people who were hurting. Now, a lot of people looked at them and said, well, they're not worthy of it. They're a little bit too dirty. They're a little bit too this. And I will tell you what, we actually, uh, one or two of the kids from uh, yeah, who were a little bit haughtier than some of the other kids, just said, oh, I don't know if I want to serve them. I'm like, what, you know, the poor kid? You know, because it's a poor family. You don't want to go out and help them. They're too poor for you. They have to meet a certain standard for you to serve them. Those are exactly the people that you're called to be a blessing to. Now, most of the kids were great, by the way. But in one or two goes up in the air. Had to be set straight with that. 
We're here to bless people and lighten their load. So this is what we learn. The very first thing I think we need to learn, learn is ignore your critics. Because it's hurtful, isn't it? When people yeah. want to criticize you. I hate that. People want to come up and tell you where to go and how to get off and how high to jump. And it just is so annoying. They're not in any way being helpful. Well, you should have done this. You would have had those types of problems. Well, thanks for telling me now. Okay? Just ignore your critics. You have permission by Jesus himself. Ignore your critics. Dismiss the critics. We should do the same thing. I, you have to have this thing called uh, self-differentiation. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that you don't care about what other people think. But self-differentiation is, is no matter what people think, I'm secure in who I am and what I'm about, that no matter what you say, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. That's a hard thing to learn because we are all, in particular pastors, we're people pleasers. We want to please people. You can't please everybody. In fact, the majority of people in life are going to always be displeased with what you do and the choices that you make. It doesn't matter. Maybe it's your parents who are displeased. Maybe I've been displeased and said, oh, you should have done that. Ignore me when I do that. Okay? Okay. There you go. Because then I got my nose in the air. And I need to be set straight. If we're sitting here being critical of each other, we're not doing the Word of God. So uh, there's, there's a true story. Uh, we actually, we do have a, um, we actually have a person who comes to our Tuesday service, and, and all of her, but she, she just constantly wants to let me know that she's not sure whether or not I'm a Christian. Because I don't speak her language, and I don't talk about Jesus the way she speaks about Jesus. <laughs> I just really doubt whether you're even a Christian. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I finally, I literally just, she said this to me like four or five times. And, uh, and I finally looked at her and I said, you know what? It doesn't matter to me what your opinion is of me. Because the only op opinion that matters to me is what God thinks of me. It doesn't, ma doesn't matter. Well, I think, I don't care what you think. I literally, I told her, I don't really care what you think. Because I am not going to heaven based on what you think of me. It's based on what God thinks of me. And so that's what we need to understand. It's what God thinks of us that's important. And how does God see us? Yeah, we might be broken. We might be shaggy around the edges sometimes. We might have things going on in our life that are mess. But Jesus always reaches his hand out, number two on this list, to lift us up. Jesus looks at us and sees the humanity and sees the image of God. And so I think what we learn is that we are to do the same for other people. We never use the shortcoming of another person to make ourselves feel superior. Because you know you're not, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know there's nobody sitting here that's better than anybody else? Except for Janice, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I see that look. <laughs> yeah. You so, know, now maybe I'm thinking that everybody's better than me. That's right. That's well. That may be true. You know, and some people think that too. They go the opposite way. So I'm telling you, both attitudes. That's a really good point. I'm glad you bring it up. There are people who do both, and there are some people who think they're superior to others, and that's why they're critics. There are others who think that everybody else is superior to them, and they feel off about themselves. Sorry, folks, but we're all the same. Nobody's superior to you. You are equal to everybody else. Nobody's better than you, you're not better than anybody else. So in one sense, I guess I wish I'd put that in the sermon handout, you know, this is a both and thing. So for those who feel they are so terrible a person, they need to understand that God has come to lift them up, that they are no worse than anybody else, that God looks at them and sees the image of God and sees their humanity, how beautiful they are. So there, take that. So sarcasm, cutting criticism, None of that is fruit of the Spirit and doesn't belong in the church and doesn't belong in our hearts. And we should not treat people that way. So that's two. Number one, ignore your critics. Lift up those who are hurting, number two. And then number three, affiliate with those who are poor and hurting. Not with the people who are powerful and the mighty who think they're better than everybody else. Because ultimately those who are empowered derive their strength by diminishing other people as well. 
And Jesus wants those who are the most broken, the least lovable, the outcasts, and wants to remind them that they are the image of God. That they have God's humanity placed in their hearts. And that's why I think those who are broken are so receptive to Jesus, because they understand that their lives are a mess. And so they can come to Jesus and accept what they have. It's the people who think that they're better than that don't have room for Jesus. So, I want to end with this, and then I'm going to tell a story. If we have a choice between befriending the President of the United States, and not just, I'm not speaking to this pre particular President or any President, just a President of any country in general, or a prostitute, remember who Jesus would choose. Hmm. Who did Jesus choose? The prostitute. Right on, the prostitute. Those were Jesus type of people. Okay? You know, there's a, a story that's told by every pastor in every simple congregation at some point, and I'm sure I've told it at some point too, and I have no true clue whether this is a true story. It doesn't matter. But the story is about a church. It was a well-to-do suburban community, and uh, everybody was dressed to the nines, and they were all dressed in their suits and ties and their dresses and their nice little sun hats for the women and on and on and on. So they're all dressed and uh, so forth. It was a college town, very well-educated people. The most respected person in the entire congregation was this 80-year-old retired professor. Everybody loved this man. He was always so dignified. He always came in his suit, and he was always dressed and very dapper and so forth. And one day, a woman came into the congregation who was less than dapper, did not fit in with this congregation. She, uh, uh, she smelled of urine, and she was filthy. Her hair was all matted. She had no shoes. She was just a dirty looking human being and she didn't just come back into the church to sit in the back pew so when she walked in she walked into the church in the middle of the service she was walking in in a daze and and just plopped herself right down at the altar and just started weeping and everybody's like what are we going to do because you know most people in this congregation looked at this dirty filthy woman and said she doesn't belong here they're hoping somebody comes and escorts her out and gets her out of the way because she's dirtying up the sanctuary and the view of the people in the pew. So nobody knows what to do, and the pastor doesn't know what to do. But this very dignified college professor knew exactly what to do. He got up, he took his suit coat off, he took off his shirt, he had an undershirt underneath of it, he rolled up his pants. He took his, took his shoes off. Everybody's like, they've never seen this man like this before. <laughs> he walked up. He sat down. And he took the woman in his arms. And he wept with her. You see, that's the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is not to look at somebody and say, oh, you're dirty or filthy or smell of urine. You don't have a place here. Jesus looks and sees the humanity, the dignity. Jesus looks beyond the outward signs and the outward body and sees what's inside, what he placed there, the image of God. And so Jesus takes his hand and reaches for those who are broken and says, these are my type of people because they're beautiful. So if you're feeling broken today, maybe you feel like you're one of the broken people. Maybe you just feel like you're not worth much. Well, Jesus, just for you, he wants to reach down and take his hand and say, you know what? You're my type of person. You might look broken to the rest of the world, but I see what's inside. And what I put there is beautiful. It is the image of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for your many blessings none the least of which is that reminder through Jesus Christ of who we truly are. We are not the broken person. We are not the filthy person. We're not the person dressed in ragged clothes and urine-stained clothes. We are what's inside of us. And what you place there is uncontaminated by those things. It is the image of God. 
is the humanity of this life that you've placed inside of each one of us, that you want to restore that image and let us see ourselves as you see us. So we pray, God, if there's somebody here today that feels like they've been broken by life and by the critics of life, help us to be compassionate enough to reach down and lift them up that they might have their hope restored. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.